Hello and welcome to episode seven of the Twist in Your Melon podcast. Um, on this episode, I'm joined by a bona fide rock star. He's the front man of the hugely successful and timeless Embrace, uh, one of my favourite bands and have been for years. Uh, it's Danny McNamara. Thanks very much for coming on, Danny. How, how are you? I'm good, my pleasure. Yeah, brilliant. It's so it's, it's like we've just kind of discussed before we started to um, recording there how how busy you are. So. <laughs> Again, it's just it's very much appreciated that you're coming on to my wee mad podcast. No, no, it's it's good. I'm I'm happy to be here. Yeah, brilliant, nice one. Um, I just wanted to pick something up with you. And I was <laughs> I was reading your um the Wikipedia page, which is always a laugh because anything can go on on Wikipedia, and it's always something something crazy in there. Um, and I I noticed, and it made me chuckle. Uh, it had like your instruments that you play, and it was like vocals, guitar, and then kazoo. Yeah, and I was like, is that just purely because of hooligan, or have you got yeah. like a, a <laughs> yeah? A, I'm a not like a, I'm not a secret kazoo maestro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought, maybe I didn't know if it was like a grading, like you can with piano with kazoo. Uh, well, I mean, there might be, but I, I, I don't be. have I don't have any grades on kazoo. Good, good. Well, there was a thing on Wikipedia that me and Gina G were involved in a in a in in a bit of an affair or something at one point which is also <laughs> completely untrue I've never <laughs> even met her so can she play kazoo maybe that's where the link goes know, maybe she does <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows Wikipedia is a crazy place but yeah I just I, I, I did chuckle at that I thought it was very funny quite a unique instrument to be um claiming that you're a, an expert in or someone's claiming that you're an expert in <laughs> I'm not I'm not an expert in any instrument really i can barely play guitar so no the vo vocals are definitely an instrument and you've yeah, you've yeah, yeah. Of that so yeah, i thought so yeah yeah cool i i just got i was just going to explain for anybody that hasn't listened to the podcast and for yourself danny um kind of a high level what what it's about so yeah. I, i've i've struggled i've played music all, all my life not to anywhere the, the level or degree that you have but I've, I've played guitar piano i've been in bands i've, I've sung um and music has always been a huge part of my life uh, but I've also had mental health issues um, in the past around with depression, with anger issues, with just struggling with stuff. And I've used many different, I've sp spoke to people, I've reached out, I've, um, I got really into, and I still am quite into mindfulness and meditation. Um, yeah. And I found while I was doing the, the mindfulness side of stuff and I was kind of exploring me and who I am and, and what I'm capable of and what helps me. Um, was that music has always been something that I've used, like just unwittingly, con yeah. used to like I would put on my favorite song or my favorite artist or my favorite album, and just when I'm feeling a bit down to pick myself up, and mm -hmm. I kind of made the, the realization that people just take the art and music for granted a lot and don't yeah. really realize because it's just everywhere, right? Like you go in the car, and the music's on. You go, the, you watch a movie, there's music. You watch a TV show, there's music. It's just everywhere. Yeah. And, it, we're consuming it all the time but we never really stop to to think about what it does to us mentally and there's there's obviously loads of studies out there about how music is is like music therapy and everything come really popular yeah. recently so that that's basically the premise of the podcast and i know that you've talked quite openly about your mental health in the past mm -hmm. um and some of the struggles that you've had um and i just kind of wanted to explore that with you and, and just around those those struggles and kind of linking it back to music and i think one yeah. of the main the main questions i had was you've been doing this for 25 years and brace have been together i think this year is that right yeah it's um the goodwill out um will have been out 25 years next year uh we've been together as a band probably nearer 30 years because we were together mm. for about six years before we got a record deal so yeah, yeah so, we've, been, we've been together a while. Yeah, a long, long time, and I'm, I'm guessing as being in a band and that long, and um, having to deal with producers and le record labels and schedules and going on tour and all that kind of stuff, throughout those those twenty five years, how has being in the band and m being being the person that makes the music and people consuming that music and and you going through the process of making it, how has how has that affected you? like mentally throughout all, the, all, all those years like dealing with being in a band making music has, do you do you ever stop to think oh this is this is what well, I'm doing this because it makes me feel this way or um I think that's a good question 
different. Um, the thing about being in a band is it's sort of like a whole food in the sense that you can live on it. Um, like rice, you know, you can mm. live on just eating rice. Um, and so um, when I left school, it just sort of became my entire world. Um, I didn't really do anything else. I didn't really worry about relationships or, um, you know, any other work or, you know, the, the thing that, that people are always going on about is to try and get that work life balance and, yeah. and stuff. Um, and, uh, and what I did was I just thought, no, hold all that and just had the band and that was it. Mm. it it was it not not completely, but sort of ninety five percent of my life was devoted to that, and I didn't really have any bandwidth for anything else. Um, and I think in some ways, it sort of acted as a little bit of an escape. Um, I wrote a line in a song um, on the Tally's album um, called "The Devil Takes Care of His Own," and the line is. The winner of the rat race is still a rat, um, and that's really how I felt. I, I really didn't want to do what everyone else was doing at the school I went to. It was a, really a case of the school doors up and and the Halifax Building Society doors up, and, and everybody just pours into mm -hmm. there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or or they go to university. Um, and there really wasn't that much else around, you know. Mm. Um, and it, none of it appealed to me. Uh, I went to university, but I only lasted a few months because I was commuting back like three times a week from Manchester to, to go to rehearsals with the band. Uh, I even tried to do a job. I got, a, I got the first job I applied for, which I got this cool little company car, which was really cool. <laughs> um, and uh, I was all right at the job, but again, it just it just took away from you know what I really wanted to do. I was I was just I was I was just thinking about it twenty four seven. Yeah. Um, so music was kind of your your life basically. Yeah. Right? From you just yeah. knew that's what you wanted to do, and that's just what you yeah. continued doing. You just and you, and have you always kind of in, in enjoyed it like for 25 years has there ever been a point where it's like i say with the schedule and the touring and all that kind of stuff you've got a family it's, it's odd it's odd to sort of think about it as enjoyable it's like it's sort of essential for me it's like you know needing to drink water or needing mm. to breathe air or needing to eat like you know water's really enjoyable when you're really thirsty but most mm. of the time it's pretty bland you know yeah Eating is great if it's a fantastic meal, but most of the time it's just a cheese sandwich or whatever, you know. Mm. And being in a band is a little bit like that. There are moments that are absolutely amazing, incredible, life-defining that, you know, I'll remember on my deathbed. But there's a lot of mundane, hard slog mm. that's anything but enjoyable and, and is and is can be really difficult, really soul-destroying. Um you know, banging your head against a brick wall all day, every day for weeks on end and not getting anything when you're trying to write an album is really difficult. Yeah, um, and when I get people saying to me, oh my God, that's my dream job. I'd love to do that. Um, I have a thing where I, go, where I just give them an acoustic guitar and say, right, okay, we'll make a start now. There's an acoustic guitar. Go in that room and don't come out until you've written a hit song. And uh, they got, you know, I've managed to persuade people to go into a room and they come out 15 minutes later and go, I can't get anything. Yeah. I go, no, you need to spend at least eight hours. Yeah. And then if you don't get anything today, I want you to do the same again tomorrow and the day after. Yeah. And we did six years of that before we had anything like a demo mm -hmm. to send out. Um, and that's not fun, but it's sort of, I needed to do it. There was like a drive in me that meant mm -hmm. that, that meant that, I felt like I was like um, down a coal mine or down down a diamond mine, mining for diamonds, just among all the dirt and the rubble, you know. Mm. And every now and again, you get one, and then you know it's really exciting for for you know when you get a song, it's like it feels. I mean, I don't really believe in God, but 
it sort of feels like God has sort of ruffled your hair up and gone, there you go, lad, you know, like it just feels like you've got a purpose and you've got a reason to be. Um, and it's the most incredible sort of feeling. And, and you can buzz off that for maybe a day or two mm. and then you go back to the ground again. So that's generally... Yeah, yeah. so it, it, it is like a job in, to, in, in a lot of aspects, isn't it, right? So... Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing, uh, for me, the thing about a job is if it's a job where you find it fulfilling, like, you know, maybe being a doctor uh, or mm. a teacher, maybe, or, you know, where it's like almost like a vocation where, mm. you know, you do the job, sort of the money is obviously important to anyone, but it's not the be all and end all of yep. the job. The job itself is, is in a way it's on reward. It's like that. But it's incredibly demanding. Um, yeah. You know, I've had people who've done other really, really high-pressure jobs. And then I've sort of discussed, you know, what, what we do. And, and it's not really often discussed because it sounds like you're whinging. You know, it's like, oh, my God, you're a rock star. Fucking hell, everybody wants to be that. Chill the fuck out, you know. So you can't really go on about how hard it is too much. But... There's a bit of stigma it's around really that. <laughs> yeah, there's a stigma around that because I, I did an episode uh, of the podcast with a, a guy I used to be in a band with, and we did a bit of research around. I think they, they, they weren't they weren't like a hundred percent proven, but they they reckoned that musicians were one of the highest percentage rates to have mental health issues or yeah. suicides. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure, yeah. And uh, people just think like you say, like you're you're a rock star. You're you going here. You're doing there. You're, you're playing in front of these thousands of people who would kill to do that to, to be in your shoes but they don't think about everything else that goes with it that you can yeah. only really experience if you've been in that situation yourself and there is a bit of stigma around i think that people just expect you just to suck it up and enjoy it yeah yeah for and, sure yeah and and you know i'm not saying it's not enjoyable it can't you know there's amazing uh moments that that you know obviously make it all worthwhile otherwise i would have given up a long time ago you know yeah. um but yeah, it's it, it can be really really tricky. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and you had like so you've had quite a few stunts in Embrace where where you've not done much for. So like I think after this new day to the self titled yeah. album it was like eight years or something, and yeah. then to this this latest album that's about to come out, it's been about three years. And obviously, yeah. pandemic is a consideration of that one. But yeah. when yeah. when you've been out of the, the game, um, so to speak, for that length of time, when when you like music is you breathe music and that is your life. Yeah. What what do you do in those situations? How do you keep yourself from? Did you have like proper low moments in there, and how did you deal with um, it? Well, um, we usually do music. The gap is just that we haven't got anything good enough yet. Mm. Um, the gap between this new day and the Tallis album is slightly different in that we did take a break we only took a break really for a couple of years it was like two or three years and then we went back in the studio and it just took us like three years to get an album good enough and um generally that seems to be how long it takes us to get an album that's good enough mm. you know i would almost be suspicious if we released an album quicker it probably might not be as good as it should be i mean we might fluke it mm. um but what I would say now is that we definitely won't release an album unless we think it's good enough now. Yeah. So it's it's dictated by that. And so the gaps are just, we're not there yet, you know. Yeah. So, so you know, you say you're just kind of, you're still doing stuff and you're still getting that music fixed. So there's yeah. never really been, yeah. do you get like... Well, banging can't... my head against the wall 24-7. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's what, I was <laughs> gonna, that's what I was gonna ask. Like if you're banging your head against the wall and you like say on those eight years, for example, between this new day and the, the self-titled album and and it was because you just couldn't produce something you felt was good enough yeah how does that affect you mentally does it become like to the point how do you how do you get yourself out of that um rut where you need to get something out good and you keep going and you keep going um that, that's really a, a, a great question again um it's really difficult to, to get great stuff. When you get something that's really good, though, it sort of shines a light on everything else. So um, on, on the, uh, what you're calling this self-titled album, we, we just refer to it as the Tallies album because there's some Tallies on the front of it. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, sixth album. 
um, it was when Richard got refugees. Um, and he wrote that and suddenly, you know, half a dozen songs that I'd written were like, oh, well, they're not good enough, you know. Um, and it sort of sets the bar. And, and then, you know, it's only if a song is sort of as good as that or better that it gets considered for the album. And, 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 and that, that's how you sort of, you maintain your sort of vision and, 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 and you keep your sense of purpose and, and, you, and you don't go mad, you know, otherwise you would, you'd go mad. Yeah. Um, chasing your own tail a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we, we sort of help each other, you know, there'll be times when one in the band is, is really struggling and we'll, and we'll help them. And, and then, then, you know, a few weeks later, they'll be the one that's buzzing the most. And, you know, and so we sort of pull each other through it. We've been, you know, this is our eighth album now, and so we know we know what the battle is, and mm. um, and and we know what we have to do, uh, and I think we're getting better. I, I actually think, not in terms of being able to write great songs, because they just seem to come out of nowhere, yeah. you know. And any artist will tell you, yeah. you know, they come at the beginning. Mostly for most artists, actually, they tend to come at the beginning and then they dry up, you yeah. know. We're, we're, I think we're really lucky in that that really, even, I think objectively that hasn't really happened to us, you know. I mean, there are, there are people who will always say the first album is their favourite, but, you know, our fourth album was our biggest and I think we're still writing songs now that are as good as the best stuff we've done. Um, but, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's difficult, but... Uh, we we sort we sort of pull each other we pull each other through it, you know. Yeah, that's one thing I was going to mention because obviously you know Bambi a brother, right? And like for what I've seen from interviews and stuff, you've got a really good relationship with him. And like, yeah, yeah. Does that does that has that helped you through the years? Like, obviously, the other band members are, are obviously there as well. And if you're you're good mates, it maybe doesn't make much of a difference. But having when you've got low moments and down moments, I can't imagine anything worse than being in a band with people we don't like when you you just have to do it because you've got. A four album deal and a well record label or something does it does it really help to have your brother yeah. in the band with you well i mean we're we're the same five people since the beginning and there's mm. very few bands that have reached our level that have managed yep. to do that uh in england the only other one i can think of is radiohead you know mm. most of the bands have lost a member or have split up and then reformed or you know um there's very 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 few bands that have done that and and the reason for that is right at the beginning when we were putting together the band, the most important thing was that we got on, that we, we were all on the same wavelength and that we, you know, we trusted each other. Um, obviously, it's important that you're able to play. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, we, we <laughs> me and Rick couldn't really play. Or, yeah, I certainly couldn't sing. And, um, <laughs> you know, we couldn't really ask for the most technically adept people to come and join us, you know. Um, and, and, and so it's sort of, we're, we're all like really close. Um, we're all very different as well. Um, and we all sort of plug into like a jigsaw piece into the hole. And when we have a meeting, if one of us is missing, it sort of goes off kilter a little bit because that fifth mm -hmm. person's influence isn't there. Um, and 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 yeah, just 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 being together, it's like a marriage, you know. We've been together for like 25, 30 years, and we've we've just we've got an understanding and a respect and a trust for each other that, that's that's come from being in the trenches on all the albums yeah. and touring the world and living in each other's pockets. That just um make, makes the bond really strong, you know. Yeah, one one big family, you might say. To use a, yeah, a song yeah, title. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and actually on that, I've got a story because one of my, my mates who actually frequents this podcast quite a bit, Neil, he was he had told me this before, but when I said I was I was I was speaking to yourself, he um he has a, a massive bond with that song, and he's actually about to very shortly get the notation for one big family tattooed on on himself. Right. Um wow. so he's like I think because he's got a big family man and I think he's had all issues with his family and stuff and I think it means a lot to him, like lyrically, and that right, kind of. Yeah. I think a lot is to me. Embraces songs have always had 
this kind of undying optimism throughout them and they're always kind of like this foundation of hope and music you interpret everybody interprets music differently right but i think the majority embrace songs and again to me have that sort of hope in them there's always uh yeah a, a sort of even when, or a build even when you're down when, even when you're down and out no, there's always like a little chunk of light at the end yeah yeah exactly like there's so many i could list off like even someday on the um out of nothing album it's just like i love that song and it's just got so much hope and optimism in it um and 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 kind of following on for that that story of, of my mate like has there ever been because the type of music that you play and because there is that hope and has there been like stories in the past that you've heard from fans and people that have that have maybe even said like that that song saved my life or that song changed my life yeah, yeah definitely uh it's happened a lot actually um even like it's even been in like newspapers and stuff that like people uh talk about and embrace on the save their life um mm. one person was on a live support machine um and someone who works for us came up to me and asked me if i'd do a cassette uh and and i did and they made it you know they got through <laughs> Wow, which is amazing, you know. Um, it's quite a responsibility, but and yeah. I've also had like uh, people who are dying who want to see me before they die and stuff like that, you know. Oh. So there's and and then yes, certainly um, I've done quite a lot of advocating for mental health, mm. and so yeah, I get quite a lot of messages from people, um, you know, particularly soldiers, for instance, who's right with ptsd yeah. and as a result of me talking about it felt um felt you know it it made them feel comfortable coming forward with their own story you know so yeah, yeah amazing amazing yeah that's what was going because you've spoken quite openly about um yourself on ptsd and um reaching out and using samaritans um yeah. and obviously there's so many and i think we're in a in society we're at a stage where mental health has been spoken about more than it ever has been which is great things like this this podcast for example probably wouldn't have as i guess That's i wouldn't even thought about it, it. <laughs> yeah i wouldn't even thought about it 10 years ago no one like how anybody was doing podcasts well no one was doing podcasts but no one was doing yeah. anything around mental yeah, health well, i mean when 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 i was ill um it's nearly 30 years ago now so um i was 19 and i'm 51 now so it's actually more than 30 years ago um and it was very 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 different then like yeah. no one was talking about mm. it uh the understanding of mental illness was that if you were mentally ill you were either a danger to yourself or other people you should be locked up they'll throw away the key mm. you'll never see your mum and dad again um you know your life as a productive citizen is over you know it, it was that because most of the stuff that you'd see on mental health would be in horror films or you know stuff like silence of the lambs or you know all that yeah. kind of thing um where you know the the uh, scary antagonist is actually a psychiatrist so you're like well i'm not going to a psychiatrist because he might be a serial killer like what you see you don't go for <laughs> help you know there's like i mean it's a fantastic film obviously but <laughs> the messaging that was coming out yeah. back then was very prohibitive for anybody who had any Kind of mental issue and then obviously like the stigma and the playground and stigma mm -hmm. you know with friends or whatever the social stigma um and, and really uh for me it was um seeing stephen fry and stan collymore uh come out and talk about it and i think that was about 11 12 years mm -hmm. ago something like that and 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 i just thought they were they were talking about depression and bipolar and i thought i need to talk about ptsd because uh, no one was doing it back then mm. no, no one even mentioned it um and so i just went for it i just wrote this blog um and and it went viral you know yeah. uh, which was weird because i i'm really not mr social media at all you know <laughs> i'm not a dancer on tiktok or you know i'm, I'm you know i i, I uh it's, it, I'm a singer in a band, you know, and I, and I know I realise that being in a band now, you have to kind of be a social media entrepreneur as well, but it's really not me, you know. No. Um, 
so yeah it was weird i just wrote this blog and and, and suddenly you know everyone was retweeting it and it, and, it, and you know and it went viral and yeah. and then uh from that the samaritans got in touch and mind got in touch and various other uh, mental health charities got in touch and and i started up started advocating for them um and then yeah it's just been sort of a journey where if someone you know wants to talk to me on a platform about mental health i do because when i was 19 if there were people who could have talked about ptsd back then i wouldn't have suffered alone in silence for so long i mean i suffered for a long time before i went for help literally because i was worried i was going to get locked up so yeah i just kept it to myself you know my suffering i kept it to myself uh and and it wasn't until i you know i was sort of having 15 panic attacks a day my mom had to actually carry me to the Mm. hospital to the doctor's um, that I went and got help, you know, I was, I was, I was in dire straits before I got help. And, um, I just, uh, seen recently, uh, Paddy the Baddy, you know, the, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the UFC, player, yeah. talking about his friend who unfortunately took his life. Yeah. Um, and that is so important that he does that because in that audience, there's, you know, thousands of men generally probably high testosterone least said soonest mended type men who would probably think opening up about their feelings might be a weakness and for him you know the main man in the room to say no you've got to talk uh is just incredibly powerful yeah it really is it really is and i think like sports seems to be like that i've been part of a podcast with football um, and it's men talking that are big supporters of football, have played football, and talking about mental health. And it, but there is still it was it's great that the, it's much more open now. And people like yourself, you've got a platform and you're you're using it for the right things, and it's brilliant. And there's so many other people doing that. Um, but there's still a lot of people out there that just feel like they can't speak up. So yeah. obviously, just need to keep getting the word out there and and trying to use things yeah. like. Talk, talking about things like the link with music and using music and stuff like that is just like that is it's just fundamental stuff that people don't ever think about and there is yeah. so many support groups out there so it's like it, it, yeah i think what you're doing is and what you have done um dan is absolutely brilliant um, i think um the best music um it's part of like it, for me anyway it's when you feel like there's someone who you've never met but their music sort of screams, you're not alone through the speaker. Yep. You know, I feel like you. I've been where you are now. Don't worry. You know, you feel lonely, you feel isolated, but you're not. And um, and it can be it can be the most unlikely song that gives you that fellow feeling, you know. But um, that's one of the most powerful things that a song can do, I yeah, think. Yeah, it really is. And that was one because, obviously, so... the your ptsd um and getting that help was before embrace right yeah and yeah did you well it was it was i was in the band but the band hadn't been uh yeah. set for a record deal yet so yeah. it was in, in the sort of early days of the band right then did you do you think that you used even unknowingly used the music or you incorporated your experience uh with with ptsd and with mental health issues to sort of inform your music and what music that you were actually creating do you think it, it, it if you hadn't had that as horrible as it was do you think you would have been able to produce what you what you did that's, a, that's another great question um i don't think so well you know i i think that because we were we were writing songs for quite a few years before um i had the breakdown mm. if you call it that um and then uh, before that, all our stuff sounded fairly derivative. We sort of sounded like a mixture of all our influences, you know, bands like mm-hmm. Acorn, The Bunny Man, and U2, and PJ Harvey, and The Cure, and all, all those bands from that from back then. And um, and then when I when I sort of when the illness came to a peak, and 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 I was having like I said, fifteen panic attacks a day, and I went to see a therapist it sort of opened up something in me 
and I wrote this song called Retread. Yeah, brilliant song. Which was just really honest and really raw and really not like anything that I was listening to at mm-hmm. all. Uh, I mean, you, we, we sort of, I, I remember Richard finding it on a, on a cassette and saying, what's this? And I was just like, oh, that's just me, you know, singing to myself at night. And he's like, no, I love this. This is great. And and then he put that guitar riff to it and it really grew. But I just thought it sounded like a country and western song, like Tammy Wynette or something like that. And and I thought it was a bit cheesy. Mm-hmm. Um and Richard was like, no, 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 no. This is this is us. This is what we're about. This is this is this doesn't sound like our influences anymore. This just sounds like us. And I think um almost being ill sort of broke a wall or a barrier inside me that was stopping me from opening up. And then the illness almost like punctured through mm-hmm. um, and enabled this stuff to gush out, you know, um, like a well almost. Mm-hmm. Because right after that, I was then writing like, you know, a song nearly every day. I mean, we talk about um, earlier on about how hard it is when you're not getting them. But back then, in the early days, I was—I was—I could just sit down and write one, you know. Um, and now and again, I can now, hmm. you know. Now and again, I get like a, a feeling. There's a there's a really weird sort of slightly anxious, slightly elevated, slightly skittish, slightly hyper feeling that comes. And when you get that, it's like right, pick up the guitar. Something's on its way, you yeah. know. Um, <laughs> And I always think when um, when artists talk about how they don't feel like they write the songs that they're sort of channeling something, it's because it's not a crafting conscious process. That moment when you get an idea, it really does come out of nowhere, mm-hmm. you know, out of nothing like the like the album, <laughs> the, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it makes total sense, and I think, I think that comes through in your music, like definitely. Like I say, there's that sort of hope and optimism through the majority of Embrace songs that, that my favourite ones anyway have all got that. And I found myself many a times when I'm feeling a wee bit low, is is putting on, um, like out in the ashes is probably my favourite Embrace song. I, I don't know what it is about it, but yeah, obviously it's, it's just a, yeah, it's yeah, an absolutely yeah. phenomenal song. Even because back when, when that came out, music videos were still quite a thing. They're not so much anymore. Yeah. And I remember, yeah. and I all, every time I listen to it, I think the music video was just accompanied that song so well when you were in the theatre and everything just coming, building back. is like everything was in yeah, the yeah. And yeah. it just, it has that, it's like a, a visual um, representation of the song and that yeah. like I'm building back up from nothing like I'm, I'm building myself back up and that's the way I interpret it and I think what you're saying there is the, the issues that you've had and um, using those through 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 your, your writing and writing your music I think it really shines in what Embrace does and I think that touches a lot of people um, and doing yeah, I think I think it's important um, that because you can't really write about hope or about or uplift people unless you've been down there you know you've got to you've got to sort of have been in the swamp you know in in the sludge um because if you just write a happy song from a happy place and you've got no understanding of what it's like to be sad and down it's not really going to be uplifting it's just going to be like obnoxious (laughs) it's going to be a little bit stepford and a bit uh you know a bit separate a bit dissociative and and uh you know, I find a lot of pop songs, a lot of bad pop songs, are sort of like, oh, look, life is lovely, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, they're not really feeling that, mate. Where's that no. coming from? Yep. So it's sort of got to come from a, a really grounded, emotional place, I think. Um, and then, you know, if you've got your foot on the ground in the darkness, then you can lift up, you know. And, and so... That's what I think the best of our songs do is they acknowledge that, you know, things are hard. I've been there where, where you are now. But look, you know, there's a bit of light here. Yeah, there is, and yeah. It's, it's, it's to sort of, it, I, I like to 
try and be positive whenever I can. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not on every single song, yeah. you know, we yeah. have got some songs that are just gen- genuinely dark uh, yeah. and sometimes it's nice to do that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's good, it's good uh, when a song comes out that does that, yeah. Yeah, well, it really does. And I think you, you guys nail it um, like massively. Um, I just wanted to touch on something you, you talked about earlier where you mentioned that you, you went to uni for like a couple of months and I don't know, again, yeah. Wikipedia could could be right, it could be wrong, but it said that you were you were looking to study psychology. Yeah. Which is yeah. Quite, I thought was really interesting because I yeah. did the subject matter. <laughs> yeah, I did it for three months. I was like, it was before I got ill, but I think in the back of my mind, it must have been like a, a sort of an area that was interesting to me, I, I guess. Maybe, maybe I could foresee that I was going to have a history of, of needing help, you know. Um, there's a common thing in 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 uh, in psychology degrees where sort of first years really look into all the things that can go wrong, and then in the mm. second year they all get something. It's like the sort of the joke, you know, or the or the, or the, the myth. Um, and in a way, I suppose that's kind of what happened to me. You know, I, I think it's a coincidence because you know I have. Um, and, an accident that led to having PTSD timed for something, you know, um, even without the accident. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and do you think, like, even though you did it for a short time, you obviously were interested in psychology, right? So did did you carry that through? Like, see, because one thing that I'm quite interested in is, like I said, music therapy and stuff like that. And try, I, I know bugger all about it, but like, I'm, I'm trying to, to learn about it because I do find it fascinating. But when you're listening to not just, like, no, no, it doesn't, doesn't have to be anything to do with your music but if you listen to any, any other music does it do you have you got that intrinsically like in your mind that this song is doing something to me like using that uh, interest in psychology if you, even if you still do it i know i realize it's a long time ago but does that interest in psychology well, I mean, ever I, link I, to music i've i've definitely uh had a lot of occasions in my life where music has has sort of soothed me you know, um, yeah. from the very early days when my mum used to sing to me as a baby, even mm. I, can remember, I can remember some of the toddler stuff definitely. Um, all the way through to like nowadays, I'll stick a Carol King song on, yeah. or you know, um, or Sly and the Family Stone, Everybody's a Star is one that generally lifts me up. Um, and yeah, you know, songs can reach you. Reaches the other parts that, that that other things leave behind. You know, it's almost like that beer commercial. Um, you know, and um, yeah, music can definitely do that, and 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 so it should, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, Danny, but I just wanted to touch on your new single that you've got that was basically just now. Is we are it yeah. um, from the forthcoming album, How to Be a Person Like Other People. Yeah. Um, the title was that about a. An oxy, the deliberate oxymoron, the title of the, the, the album, like like being a person like other people, or is it is it is it sort um, of like ironic? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, kind of. It's taken from um, the script for the Joker, uh, you know, the film with Joaquin. Joaquin yeah, 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 yeah. And in it, there's a scene where the Joker uh, is watching some tapes of. Uh, Robert De Niro's chat show host yep. introducing guests and he's going to be on the show later on yep. and so he's watching it and he's he's watching how the guests get introduced how they sit down how they hold their drinks and he's watching how to be a person like other people and I read that and I just thought I really related to it because I had quite a wild imagination when I was a kid mm. And it made me quite feel quite isolated and separate. And I guess being in a band was almost like my way of curing that because it didn't matter that I was separate and isolated because I was being creative, yep. you know. And, um, but I met my wife uh, nearly a decade ago now. And, um, and one of the things that, she has done for me is show me how to be a person like everyone else 
uh, and sort of day by day, there's nothing like having two children under three to snap you out of <laughs> any, you know, any wild imagination or creativity you might be doing, you know, um, yeah, I know that one. and bring you down to earth, you know, yep. and, and, and it's been, it's been an incredible journey, a, a really sort of a roller coaster ride, a really, really joyful as well. Um, in not in like a shallow, like obvious way, but in a really deep, gentle, hard to spot way. Mm. I just feel happier than I ever have, you know, uh, because I've let real life in. It's not. I'm not so much in my head anymore. Yeah. I mean, I'm still really creative, but I'm more balanced now and, and happier. Um, and yeah, how to be a person like other people is all about that journey. And we are it is basically about me and my wife. Because, mm. you know, um, I wrote uh, the, f the first ever sort of prop song that I wrote, Retread. I wrote that line, I've find myself redeemed because no one's seen the bad in me or been where I've been and not turned to leave. And, but then, you know, my wife came along uh, and, and she didn't turn to leave, you know. Um, so in a way, We Are It is like the end of the story that began with Retread, you know, yeah. or, or, or another another landmark in the story. Yeah, There's and, yeah. more the stories yeah. coming up, but yeah. Brilliant, and it's like a fantastic single. Um, it's back. I think it's back to it's more towards like the good will out kind of stuff. Right. In my opinion, okay. it just I think I think it's not like I I think out of nothing's probably my favorite uh, album, but yeah. I think the obviously good will out was, was seminal. Um, and I think that yeah, the yeah. BR is is fantastic, and you can tell again that the, the love that you've put in just that story you've told about being about your wife and we are it and. You, you yeah, can yeah, yeah. feel that in the song, so it's uh, brilliant. It's, it's great to have you yeah, back. It's all, all real. Um, yeah. There were there were a couple of songs that we wrote um, for the album that were really catchy, but they just didn't have that emotional yeah. wallop, you know. Yeah. And so we didn't put them on the album. The album mm. is all about that, you know. If it doesn't get you, then it's not it's not going on there. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, just quickly to to finish things off, Danny, I, I do this for, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I do this for right. uh, the end of every um, episode uh, when I got a guest on, I ask them um, for to, to pick one song just off the top of their head, just kind of organically, that if you were feeling a bit down, you were feeling a bit out, out of sorts, and you had to go and put one song on that you knew would lift you up, what, what would yeah. it be? Um... The one that my mum used to sing when I was a toddler, which is The Carpenters and Close to You. Brilliant. That's a great song. Absolutely great song. And I, 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 Do you quite often listen to it? Or? Um, I, I hardly ever listen to it, but I do, you know. I, I do sing it to myself. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Have you, have you when, like... I, when I need to self-soothe, like I, I sort of, yeah... Kind of will sing that to myself as I'm walking around. Yeah, that's, that's great. And did you like release? Have you tried to obviously? Oh, I two kids? No, 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 no. That you can't touch that. It's <laughs> no, but even 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 in the house with the family, would you would you sing it to your kids and to your oh, wife? Oh yeah, and... definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'll definitely be singing it to mine. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, that has been fantastic. I don't, I don't want to keep you longer than than need to because I know you're very busy but that has been such an insightful conversation. Um, like I say I've I've been a fan for many years and just speaking to you, you're such a great down to earth guy and um, this has been it's absolutely been my brilliant. My, my absolute pleasure. Good luck with the, with the podcast. And thanks mate. Yeah, thanks. Hopefully so having me on will mean that you'll get more you know, higher profile people. And, ho ho hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. It's, it's still in its infancy and I'm just kind of working the ropes. But yeah, I like I, I think um I really enjoy doing it, and that's the main part. I'm not Well you can you can tell. You can yeah, definitely tell it's a passion, which is great. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks. Um yeah, thank you very much again for coming on and uh all the best with the new album. Uh, and I'll see you in the crowd uh, on the first of September <laughs> in Edinburgh. I'll great. give you a little wave. <laughs> all right.
All right. Thanks thank so you mate. very much. Speak soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.